This is the Same Jesus Podcast, a conversation between a pastor, a theologian, and their guests excavating what it means to follow Jesus in the context of a movement known as the Foursquare Church. In this first season, A.J. Swoboda, Russell Joyce, and all their guests will discuss the identity and values that have been the ethos of Foursquare for the past 100 years. You're listening to Episode 2, Kingdom. We are kicking off. So again, just a recap for those who might have skipped Episode 1. With the title, like the same Jesus, we can go all sorts of places yep. with with our seasons. With this yes. first one, we have a very specific agenda, which is we want to articulate the core identity, and the core distinctives and DNA of the Foursquare Church yes. that we're a part of. Yep. Episode one. We, we do it humbly, though. We humbly. don't know everything. Absolutely. We're coming out oh, yeah. From, For the, sure. Stuff we we gave all the qualifiers in episode yep. one. We are Absolutely. not Foursquare historians or theologians. We're, we're just, just two dudes that two love this thing. Two dudes that love this thing and love Jesus. Yes. So from that angle and with that passion, we began our season by talking about Jesus. That when we say foursquare, really what we're talking about is the fourfold ministry of Jesus. Savior, the healer, the baptizer with the Holy Spirit, and soon coming king. But to build off of that, as soon as we talk Jesus, we're going to be talking kingdom. Yes. If there was a word that I think is a close second to Jesus when we talk about foursquare, it is kingdom. It's literally on the cornerstone of Angela's Temple. So Angela's Temple, that was Amy's church, started in 1920s in Los Angeles. It was the mother church for our movement. The cornerstone, and I know you know this, but some of our listeners might not, says dedicated unto the cause of interdenominational and worldwide evangelism, which is to say Foursquare, a denomination, is Interdenominational in spirit. Yep, what denomination puts that on their cornerstone? Yep, we do. We do. Because we are committed to the kingdom, yep. which is to say we can work with anyone yep. and we will work with anyone. When you it, think with yeah. boundaries, with I mean, boundaries, I, I think of course, we, in Foursquare, there would be, there would be a sense at which we would be committed to, you know, denominations, whatnot that have a high view of scripture, yeah. that worship Jesus, all that stuff. But that that's pretty rare yes. in, in, in the denominational world. So let, can we define some terms here? What yeah, do we do mean it. by kingdom? So yeah. Let's let's define kingdom. You tell us, theologian. So, well, two, let me and, and two, two sides to this. Number one, you, you hit the nail on the head. When you look at the Gospel of Matthew, for example, the first time Jesus speaks, and the first time, so the first time Jesus preaches a sermon in his hometown, and the first time John the Baptist speaks. So this, you got to understand, in biblical literature, when you have somebody who's, repetition is a big deal. The first sermon Jesus preaches and the first thing Matthew records John the Baptist saying is it's the same thing. They both say, repent the kingdom of heaven is in hand. Yeah. We, so scholars would all say, anytime that the authors of these texts go out of their way to say things like John the Baptist's first words and Jesus' first preaching message was the same thing, yeah. means it's important. Yeah. <laughs> the kingdom was at the center yeah. of Jesus' ministry. Yeah. So let's define what the kingdom is because yeah. he, here's the problem. We start talking about the kingdom, and all of a sudden, I start thinking like institutional power. Right. I start thinking right. like queens and kings and princes and all this sort of What do we mean by kingdom? I think the best definition of kingdom— Oh, you weren't asking. You had an answer for it. I have an answer to my own question. <laughs> Thank you. Let the kingdom come here a little bit. Okay, can you get out of the kingdom way? Go ahead, okay. sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> Dallas Willard's definition— I was literally going to say Were you that. really? I was. Are you serious? I was. Holy Spirit. Yep. Okay, yep. that was too loud for the mics, but I like it anyways. He defines the kingdom as the effective range of God's will. And basically, the big idea is this. Effective with an E. Effective. Correct. E, not A. Yes. Not affective. Effective will. The the big idea is this. You could translate that to me. Wherever what God wants is happening. Yep. Exactly. For Amy, her her whole dream was what, what would it look like? If Christians of different movements that all love Jesus came together for a common cause, yep. well, that got her in a lot of trouble. It did. Because that's threatening. Yeah. I think in a lot of times in our in our world today, denominations actually use theology more as marketing than yes. actual beliefs. Yes. So we we say we believe something, but that's really just our way of saying we're not like those people mm-hmm. down the street. Yep. It's our and competitive advantage. Exactly. Yeah. Amy had a different kind of impulse that frankly is so stinking inspiring. What if Jesus was not somebody who came to create a world in which Christians are constantly finding differences. Mm -hmm. But what if Jesus sought to create a community where he he was the center and we were able to work together? So when you say kingdom, I just want to be careful to say, 
I don't, if Amy was sitting in the room, I actually don't think her idea of kingdom is like empire. Exactly. Yes. We are not saying empire. Yes. And there's a lot of theological language around empire and exile. We, kingdom does not mean empire. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So how do we see the kingdom in her ministry and her work? What have you found in, in terms of what Amy did? Well, yeah. how did? How did she practice the kingdom? What did she, what did she try to do? Totally. Well, I mean, it's interesting even to take a step back when you think about kingdom with this framework that we've just established. There's a couple aspects to the kingdom in Jesus's ministry that I think Amy tried to epitomize as well. And one is the kingdom is incarnational. Yes. Which is to say it's relational. Ah. The word did not become a book. The word did not become a doctrine. The word did not become a podcast or a podcast. The word became flesh. The word became a human and entered into relationships. Eugene Peterson's famous translation of John 1, 14. The word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. The kingdom is relational. And you see that within Foursquare. Foursquare has such a high view on kingdom relationships, recognizing that the currency of the kingdom is relationship. And in Amy's day, I mean, we kind of already hinted at it. She would be in relationship, obviously with parameters, yeah. but, but also there's some controversy where she would be in relationship like, like, I think you wanted to share. Well, she, I mean, talk about going, going to dark places, yeah. right? This is going to probably ruffle a, a few feathers, but it's Amy's life, so it's not our fault. But totally. it is his, his it's history. True. It's true. You know, in our, in our moment, we're guilty by association. Mm-hmm. And if you are friends with somebody, it apparently means that you agree with them. But right. Amy, she did not build her ministry on these assumptions, these kind of cancel culture-ish assumptions. A great case in point would be Amy's Weird. I think I'm yeah. comfortable with the word weird yeah. relationship with the KKK. Yep. So for example, there's many stories that come out of what would happen when Amy would preach when KKK members, which by the way, the KKK members really did not like Amy because she believed in inter in interracial worship. Which is also an interesting fact that like even before, just to interject briefly, C.H. Barfoot, who studied- It's a uh, great last name. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing it right studied the makings of modern Pentecostalism, has said that Amy was perhaps, arguably, the first evangelist in modern America to hold integrated revival meetings in the South. In the South. In the South. So probably, arguably, the first revivalist in modern America to integrate revival meetings in the South. We have have an image of Amy's daughter, Roberta, being baptized by a Black pastor. So she was integrated in her views. If you want to get put, if you want to get put on the 10 most wanted list for the KKK, that's the kind of stuff you start. Totally. So she would preach. And when in Angela's Angela's temple, when KKK members would come to disrupt services, I I heard this story. This is anecdotal, but a a scholar who studied Amy's life told me that this was one of her stories was that a group of KKK members came into Angela's temple. She's preaching and they get up in the middle of service to disrupt what she's doing. And she stops mid sermon. And she slams her hand down on the pulpit and she looks at him. I mean, you just imagine Amy, this sweet, you know, cinematic, you know, figure. And she slaps her, but, or her hand down on the table and she looks at them and she says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. She said those words. Yeah. And afterwards, there was a newspaper reporter who took a photo at Echo Park across the street of a pile of KKK robes, apparently from the men who had encountered Jesus and left their robes behind. Wow. Okay, there's that. But you pointed out to me, and this was this was a part of her story that I was unaware of before doing our research, was that she would actually go. Yeah. This is insane. Yeah. She would go to KKK meetings. They and would send preach. a car for her and that she would go and preach. Absolutely insane. Yeah. And she would not condone no. their racial views. No, but she would slightest. go. But she would go and preach. It it is like, it is like, it's almost like the it's almost like the Samaritan woman in reverse. Hmm. Jesus goes to the woman who's been ostracized. And here we have the woman going to the ostracized <laughs> for right reasons. Yeah, they yeah. have been marginalized and they should be totally. for their perspective. Totally. But she is even willing to go to the cultural. I mean, at that time, they were not cultural levels. Right. In our eyes, they, they, that, they were starting to become that way. They but were yeah, become but yeah, more and more yeah. and more. But she was, she, again, I'm not trying to in any way, shape or form empathize totally. with the KKK. Totally. But she was unwilling to allow cultural boundaries and barriers to keep her from the worst of sinners. And I think we need to we need to like say that that's something that we realize it will ruffle feathers. But integrated, arguably the, the first integrated revival meetings in the South. Yeah. Yep. And when the KKK would send a car, she would go and preach. Yep. 
Yeah. Can we imagine a modern preacher yeah. with, with sort of the pull, the polarization? It's Paul. What does it look like? Yeah, it's Paul. I mean, it really is. Paul, when he, Paul is with Greeks, when, when, when he was with Athenians, he talks right. one way. When he's with Romans, he talks another. When he's with the Ephesians, he talks another way. Oh. And it's not that he's changing the message. It's no. not like that Amy was changing what she was. She was just a brilliant missionary yeah. Yeah. who knew how to bring the gospel to every room that she found herself in. And, you know, I, I, it would be really interesting to see what she would be like on Twitter today. <laughs> I, I think she would be, she would probably be hated by- Do you think oh, she'd be on Twitter? I do. Okay. She probably would buy Twitter. And she was wildly willing to utilize mass media in the most creative ways. I don't know. I, she yeah. be, I, 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 I think she'd probably be highly committed to those mediums, but she also would probably really upset everybody on those. Totally. Mediums. Yeah. yeah. But I think at least the, the first aspect, when you think about the kingdom, what does it mean for the kingdom and the range of God's effective yeah. will? It's relational. It's incarnational. Yeah, absolutely. It, it moves to exactly where people are at. Yep. And it's not in a way that says you're great just the way you are. It says you're accepted as you are in Christ Jesus. Yep. Now come and leave your sin behind yep. and let's, let's walk toward him. And again. holiness too. Jesus, holiness. Our, our holiness, holistic. There were, in our research, as we were studying, we, I came across at least, and I'm sure you saw this as well, but the, the LA Times, there would, be, there would be like a weekly column about her. Mm-hmm. She would get more airtime in the, in, the, in the Los Angeles uh, Times than, you know, like the, the, the police bureau would. And People got so jealous because of how much attention. Charlie Chaplin was coming to the service incognito yeah. Yeah. in the back. But she would get all this attention. And, oh, this was another thing that I love about Amy is she would get critiqued by everybody. Everyone. And she would preach sermons praising the people that were being mean to her. I mean, talk about being incarnational. Totally. Of, of sh- Talk about loving the enemy. The enemy, absolutely. Yeah. Going out of your way yeah. to like shed love on people that are just hating. And you do see that. You see that she's constantly, and this isn't meant to be an episode about Amy, but it is, I think there's something really compelling about who she was in her ministry that is in the charism yeah. of Foursquare, yeah. of, of kingdom you see that she's constantly stuck in the middle. Both mm. sides don't like her. So uh, we mentioned earlier, when, when the Baptist church credentialed her, which again, credentials didn't mean yeah. anything to her. It was permission of relationship to preach the gospel. AG got mad. So you see these aspects of, is she really Pentecostal? Is she not Pentecostal? Then as, she, as Angela's temple starts growing, she starts adopting more cinematic, theatrical presentations of the gospel. You see the holiness movement saying, is she really holiness? Like, yes. does she really care about, you know, the, the, the long skirts or whatever it is? Like, is she holiness or is she now culturally yeah. too relevant? You see, and, and with all of these, there is a sense of, and I'm not saying that the, the other movements did this, but there is a sense of they're centering something other than Jesus. Yes. yes. And Amy constantly centered Jesus. And that's a phrase that we hear in our cultural moment. Like we hear things that we need to center ourselves or whatever. We need to center this aspect or that aspect. And that's not to say that we shouldn't hear our respective voices from the position that we yep. come from. But Amy, and I, I would agree, we center Jesus, yeah. which is to say we don't center a particular doctrine. We center the person of Jesus yeah. and we center the relationships that come in this incarnational space. Yeah. I can't, I, I, tell me if I'm right about this. Cause I didn't, I didn't have, to, I didn't have to pastor through the, the pandemic. I did, I did not have that privilege, but also this, the, I mean, and I say yeah, privilege in sure. the sense that for sure. you bear the scars on your soul, yes. but you also receive the blessings from that. And yeah. for the pastors that are watching that had to God's grace and mercy to you. But I have observed at least broadly speaking that in Foursquare in the post pandemic world, somehow with all the issues that our, our, our denomination has all sorts of problems with it. But I am wildly pleased that we have not seen in the post-pandemic world a denomination that has gone to the right or the left politically, yeah. but has sought to remain yeah. centered on Jesus. Yeah, and, and maybe even double down on that. Yeah. I would say like with, with friends that I have in the movement, I've seen a resurgence of just desire for the presence of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And, and where there has been maybe even pre-pandemic a sense that we were moving one way or another. Yeah recognizing yeah. that saying, no, 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 we need to center Jesus again. Amy would be proud. I think, I think <laughs> Hopefully. she'd be proud. <laughs> Is she tweeting that right now? Right now. Hey, I'm really proud yeah. of you guys. Yeah. So, so the kingdom is incarnational. It's relational. You just brought up a really good point 
about if Jesus is the center, we're not drifting to the right or the left. Because politically. Of, politically. Yes, 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 politically. Politically. Because the other thing or an aspect of Foursquare's understanding of theology of the kingdom is the kingdom is holistic, mm-hmm. which is to say it's both vertical and horizontal yes. in, yes. in dimension and yeah. relationship. Absolutely. And you see that in Angela's temple and in Amy's work. You see that her constant cry is that people would receive personal salvation, that their lives would be transformed on a personal level. But you also see that Angela's temple and, and the ministry she led are deeply committed to social salvation. Yeah. That, yeah. that if we are made right with God, our neighborhood has to be cleaned up. Yep. Like there, that that is part of the exact same gospel. It works vertically and horizontally. It's that's a complete. It's a, it's like a prophetic. Res- which is which is we're not polarized to the right or the left. That's exactly. That's right. it. It feels like it at least in our moment in time. If if you want to be an activist and care for the community, you go to a progressive church. But if you want to lead people to Jesus, you go to the conservative evangelical church. And I think Amy, if she was in our situation, she'd say hogwash to it all. Totally. She, she would be like, 100%. "Don't force me to pick one side of God's kingdom." Yeah. And and I think she would she probably yeah progressives and conservatives would both be mad at her yeah for for an, you and I have a mutual friend John Tyson in New York City I love what he, he when he's asked like how do we know we're preaching the kingdom and he always says when everybody walks away take to uh, what you're saying sure so, to yeah. something in effect and yeah. I think I think Amy would embody that she yeah. would wear that as like a I don't know, she'd almost be proud of the fact that she was hated by everybody totally um, yeah that's I mean Nate I that is a unique that's a unique four square thing is is the is the commitment to I don't want to say the word social gospel because I I don't think there's a difference between the gospel and the social gospel those aren't two different things totally but just an unwitting commitment to a holistic approach towards the good news. well it makes me think Stanley Hauerwas one of my favorite theologians oh, he he actually yeah. talks about and this this is nuanced but he talks about how why do we use the qualifier social for justice mm-hmm. before justice it's just justice. The reason why we call it social justice, at least in secular spaces, is because we want to be whoever we want to be in private, but still maintain this public sort of justice in, in the public forum. But you can't have it. You can have private justice where how we treat our families when no one's mm. watching needs to be just and equitable and how we treat our kids and our spouses. And then that spills over to the social spaces as well, Absolutely. which is the kingdom. Yeah. Which, if we're going to be made right with God vertically, it must spill over. Here's my last point about the kingdom the being last holistic. Point. The last one I have. Okay. All right. So during the Great Depression, there was an undercover reporter for the LA Times. And I think it was a she, but she would go around to various nonprofits to see if how the money was being spent, donations. Mm. And she basically wrote this scathing report that everyone, I don't know about everyone, but it was corruption. Like people weren't spending the money. Except, she says, Amy Simple McPherson nice, and Angela's Temple, that when she went there, that the money was going precisely where it said it was going to be going. People were being fed, people were being clothed, wow. people were being housed. And I think it just speaks to the core of, of Foursquare, of when we say we're kingdom, it is a vertical salvation, it is a horizontal salvation, and you cannot divorce the two. And if there's anyone who understands just the nature of kingdom and what we're talking about, it's Ted Vale. Absolutely. Ted Vale, vice president of something globally. I don't even <laughs> know his full global. title. Global. He, he, he does everything yeah. and he knows everyone. He's a and he's got and he's a globalist. He's a and globalist. he's got stories yeah. he does it all. for days. So yeah. we're gonna talk to Ted. All right, we are joined by Ted Vale, which Ted, AJ just called you a globalist. <laughs> you are a globalist in our movement. What globalist. It, you're, you're, you have to say it like that. Globalist. Go, I don't think anyone can say it like John that. John Goldberg always says it. Globalist. <laughs> your official title, Ted, you are the global, you're, you're the vice. What, what are you, Ted? What exactly is your role? <laughs> yeah, you just said vice and stopped. Right. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so I'm the vice president of global operations, I think is the, the main title I carry right now. Yeah. But even, even I mean, comically, the fact that we didn't even know your title, but everyone in Foursquare knows you across the globe speaks to the conversation we want to have with you around kingdom. Because kingdom has been a central, like we said, I mean, this is episode two. So we are Jesus-centered as a Foursquare movement. And then we have an expansive kingdom theology, which includes partnerships, kingdom partnerships, which includes interdenominationalism. And in many ways, you've embodied that over the course of your career. So let's start with this. 
When you think about the cornerstone of Angela's Temple, dedicated unto the cause of interdenominational and worldwide evangelism, why is that such an important phrase for us and our kingdom theology? Yeah, well, the kingdom of God is, uh, it's about relationships, first of all. I know that we want to go right to doctrine or we want to go right to structure and to organization, but it is about relationships. It's about relationship which, between us and God. But, but really that cornerstone, when you think about the, as we know, the lay of the land at that time, this is about relationship between one another. And it's between crossing borders and boundaries. And when you think about even the life of our founder, the ministry of our founder in that day, it really is about traversing all of these barriers that are out there and bringing us together. And so that really, in many ways, expresses when we say kingdom, that we're all under this broad umbrella of kingdom, that this is under where Jesus is, Jesus is king and we are all subjects under this under this kingdom. And so I guess this is where we place such a high value on on Jesus as King and we're all in this kingdom. And so even connecting back to my not always knowing what my title is, <laughs> the I, globalist. I feel like it is it it I, I feel like my life is an expression of relationships come first. People come yeah. first. Yeah. And that means that a lot of times these are people that they're maybe they're not four square or they're out on the, the fringes of four square or they're from another nation. And it's like we're all in on this together. Yeah. So it's in that way, it's very inclusive within kingdom. Right. Well, well even something that you pointed me to that I was I had totally just overlooked was that that concept of interdenominationalism, which I assumed, because when you hear that today, you think doctrine. Interdenominationalism has to do with doctrine. But you pointed out that in Amy's day, it actually meant more nationality. So the crossing borders was not just crossing doctrinal borders. It was crossing national and ethnic borders. Would you speak more about that? Yeah, certainly. And certain props to now the late Joe Sutton, an inner city Minneapolis black pastor, that he was the one that pointed it out to me because he just said, hey, back in that day, if you were if you were Dutch, then you were likely reformed. If you were if you were from Italy, if you were from Mexico, if you were from Ireland, then we likely know your religious affiliation. If you were from Germany, we likely know. And LA being that place where a lot of immigrants came, we you could suggest people's main religious identity or affiliation at that time. And so it wasn't about doctrine as much as it was about your ethnicity. And, and so at that time, when, when Sister McPherson would say preaching the four square gospel, it wasn't preaching our denomination. It really was lifting up Jesus and lifting up Jesus amongst different people groups. And, and so yeah, that was that was it. And, you know, sometimes I wonder if we're up for another denominational remix sometimes, maybe not by by our denominational names, but we're finding new ways to connect and affiliate ourselves once again. And so under this banner of God's kingdom, that's the beauty of this is relationships just take us in different ways and places. Yeah. There's a there's a little bit of a hesitancy that I have. We we talked in in our initial conversation before before talking to you about the holistic nature of the kingdom of god and and there's a there's a little bit of i think i can say i don't know hesitancy that i have in looking at amy's life in the sense that this was a real broken woman you know she she had gone through a number of divorces there were a number of scandals um she died of an overdose She was a workaholic and essentially died of a sleeping pill overdose. She was a broken woman. And I I sometimes look at her life and there's a little bit of a, I don't know, there's just a little bit of me me that wonders, man, I wish she had a holistic kingdom theology for herself. Speak for a moment to pastors 
in understanding the kingdom on an emotional level? Like, what does it look like to be a healthy, holistic person that lives in the kingdom in, at our moment in time? Yes. Well, I would say my observation from Sister McPherson pushing us to this is she was an expansionist. So he's <laughs> a just, globalist. He, she, a globalist. Yeah, she, <laughs> <laughs> so, so she, in her interdenomination, she is just expanding this. For most of us today, looking to her life and putting it to ours, she, she did not have a life full of friends, a life full of mm. interconnectedness and relationship. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard some of our leaders use the term spiritual community. And I feel like that's something that we crave. And if I put that to us today if, and think about holistic, the way you're saying it, one of the greatest gifts that we have and that we can enjoy is spiritual community. And with spiritual community around us, brothers and sisters, and especially the more diversity that we can have in this, then the more holistic and balanced we can even find ourselves. But however that, whatever that looks like, it means that we're not only not alone. AJ, I've heard you talk about this. It's not good for man to be alone. And that's not just a wedding verse. Um, that, that there really is this idea of many around us that God has placed. But But yes, there's our relationship with us, with us in the Lord. Of course, that that is, I want to say, maybe a foregone conclusion. But there's this rich exchange that happens between us and others. And oftentimes we found, and I want to say in my U.S. relationships as a pastor, as a missionary, and then globally all over the world, our lives are so much richer because of relationships yeah. in God's yeah. kingdom. Yeah. And yeah. And maybe something that our founder, I can't comment on whether she actually found this or not, but I can say that we can find this. And that is a lot of times when we look at people from other nations or even different ethnicities, we a lot of times see them only as people that could receive from us. What do they need? And yet so often it's them that bring so much richness into That's our lives. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Which is real relationship. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, we, we share our lives together yeah. with one yeah. another. Yeah. Yes. So true. So <laughs> my life is so much richer because of Native American spirituality, Na Native American Christians that have given, African American believers that have inputted into my life, and women and men. And so all of that diversity around us, which I know is not always possible for all people all the time. But essentially, the more input that we can have from all of this, which reminds me of Pentecost itself in Acts 2, all of that age, gender, ethnicity that we speak of. And I do think, reflecting back, that maybe our founder didn't have all of that, but she had quite a bit of it. But we now have the luxury of looking at that and saying, we can have all of this. And the kingdom of God does run on the currency of relationships that are mutual and not just and not just us giving. And then I think the ultimate spiritual force is unity. And unity is a kingdom, this is a kingdom culture word that, maybe I could say it this way, when I think about kingdom, I think about like, because uh, I love cultures and nations, of course. And uh, even when I think about a kingdom like the United Kingdom, like when we think of uh, Great Britain and the United Kingdom, they have different rules. They have different culture and norms. And when you go to the UK, you don't drive on, you don't drive on the right side of the road. You drive on the left. It's, this is, is an obvious rule, law, part of their culture. So there are things that are just backwards or different than what we're used to. Now you take that to the nth degree and Jesus on the a Sermon on the Mount gives us the ultimate counterculture of, of the culture of God's kingdom that so many things are, as we talk about, upside down and inverted, and that the servant is greater, and if you want to save your life, you lose it. But if we brought that down real practically, I, I would just bring it to this way. If you want to grow, it's going to come in unity and in exchange with others, and you're going to receive something amazing from somebody that you didn't expect. A boy with loaves and fish is actually going to feed you and give you something amazing. And that's where unity is the spiritual force. And, 
And really, all the gates of hell can't prevail against it when believers are united together. And so, and, and, and always, we always joke that unity, unity isn't just when everybody agrees with me. Unity really is when we are coming together in relationship in the body of Christ. But I would contest that we can't just have unity in a local church alone. We can, but I mean, but that's not really what we're after here. And if kingdom partnership isn't just unity in a denomination or a network, but when unity traverses movements and, and affinity and, and denominational lines and it crosses barriers and borders, there is something beautiful that pleases the Father. Yeah. I, so can, can I ask a question? You can, but okay. I, I got a hot one. I, I, I got to drop. Go for it. How hot? Like one to 10? Uh, it's up at seven or eight, but you, you go ahead. You're at nine. I can see it in your eyes. Okay. All right. So. Ted, if there's one thing we know about you, it's that you got stories. You got stories for days. And I love the shape of our conversation about relationship, that when we think kingdom, and we said this earlier in the episode, we're not talking about empire, which empire, with that understanding of kingdom, is very hierarchical. It's, not, it's very transactional relationships. We're actually thinking true reciprocal relationships that foster unity. Is there an example, Ted, in your ministry that kind of epitomizes everything you were just talking about. About the kingdom. About, about the, kingdom the kingdom and the of currency yeah. of relationship yep. and crossing borders and what it looks like when we view relationship as what we give and what we receive from others and something beautiful that is birthed out of that. Is there, some, is there a moment or a story that comes to mind for you? Well, there's a bunch. So <laughs> one of my, fa- one, one of my a, a couple of favorites. A couple of my favorites. One of them is Foursquare Disaster Relief. So Foursquare Disaster Relief was, was really launched recognizing that we needed to respond globally and domestically with better competency and, and, and really be a help to local people in crisis. But we also quickly realized that we lacked competency and others already had it. But we had something. We had local people on the ground. So we needed something, but we also had something. And then we modeled it after the commissary, actually, local church, local ministry, providing something to everybody, no strings attached, but hope attached was always the kind of Which, the byline. Explain, explain the commissary for those who might not know what it is. So commissary, of course, maybe more of a military term of, of a place of supplying and everything. But the idea was it, it started in uh, Sister McPherson's ministry during the Great Depression, They created a place with food and clothing, especially, and supplies for people where anybody in Los Angeles could could receive uh, food or clothing or supplies, essentially no questions asked. And Angeles Temple, one church in Los Angeles, actually outgave the entire social structure of the city of Los Angeles during one of America's greatest crises, the Great Depression. And... And so, but that model really, if you could say model, that idea was that a local church could do this. And just as much as as ambulances would pull up with stretchers and bring the sick to be healed, knowing that they probably aren't even going to need to go to the hospital. But did you know that people also pulled up and would bring the destitute and the poor and people that were just in need or lost their job and knowing that they would actually get their needs met here. And so... I just feel like, what a great example of church, but it didn't happen because because somebody was rich. It happened because as a community, back to kingdom, they came together like in Acts 2 and Acts 4. They just came together and brought what they had so that everybody else could receive something. These are the examples that we see in scripture. So it's fun to see it lived out. So with that in mind, this is Foursquare Disaster Relief. Let's all bring what we have to the table, and then let's share it with people in their times of deepest need and crisis. And what we found was that at times other denominations or other networks, other ministries that are dedicated to disasters or crises, some that are Christian, but some that aren't, and that everybody was coming to help. And we found that there were things that we were particularly gifted at. And then other times, you know, we would say, hey, we're sorry, we don't have big cargo ships or C-130 cargo planes. And then groups would say, that's okay, because we don't have local people on the ground that know the language and the culture. And we found ourselves partnering 
when it's very tempting at times to want to control and want to be the alpha leaders of, of something, and you actually, it requires, it requires humility at times. It requires saying we don't have all the answers. It, it, it requires letting other people be in charge. But the more we are willing to do this, we actually have seen amazing things happen. And, and so that's one example. I'll just tell you real quick, my other, one of my other favorite examples is we tell great stories about the, the nation of Niger in Africa because it's a, tough, it's a tough stony ground culture in kingdom of God terms from the parable of the sower. It's a stony ground nation, tough, and yet we've seen amazing church planting happen there. But the only reason we see church planting happen there in Foursquare is because we couldn't get a registration. The government wouldn't give us one, but the Assemblies of God shared their registration with us. So the only reason that we're there is because because Mm -hmm. our friends at the Assemblies of God said, you guys, we're kingdom people, as we use that term. And that means that we would much rather see, we'd much rather see Assemblies and Foursquare both flourish here than just hog this to ourselves and kind of keep this secret to ourselves. And we've actually seen that happen in many nations, some places where we're sharing with others, other places where somebody else is sharing with us. Yeah, because the same goal. We, we want to see the kingdom come. We don't want to see the force yeah. of the kingdom come. We want to see the kingdom of Jesus come. Yeah, yeah so true. And doesn't that, doesn't that please the Father? And isn't that the yeah. kind of a That's movement or church that, that I, would, I would hope anybody would say, I just want to be a part of that. Whoever's doing that, I want to be in on that where... We're just all together after the same goal. And we have, yes, we have different polity. We have certainly different ways about doing things. But in the end, we want Jesus to get the glory. Jesus is the yeah. king of the kingdom. Amen. Amen. You know, for a globalist, you have a lot of great things to say. But I loved, <laughs> and this was my hot question that I had just a few I was wondering ago. if you are going to go back to it. You, I just, is it still hot? Is it's, it still it's at a nine it's now. It's a nine. Wow. It has Hotter. morphed. Hotter. I'm going to drop it because it's, 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 are you ready? Drop it like it's hot. Okay. Humility. Ted, you just mentioned, you cast a vision of the kingdom that is mutual. It's not one way. And I, I, I can't help but think of moments, even in the gospels, when Jesus commands his disciples to do something that would force them to need help. For example, he tells the disciples as he sends them out, don't go with their staff. Don't go with a purse. Don't go with extra money. Why do you do that? Because when you go, you're going to need some people to help you along the way. Talk for just a moment about how the kingdom of God actually influences how we understand power. How do we think about power in light of the kingdom of God? Oh, goodness. The first thing that comes to my mind is is just the kingdom value that Jesus says, hey, the lords of the Gentiles, they say, if you want to be great in our world, you're great based on how many people are you in charge of? And and honestly, even in the church sometime, they're going to go, hey, come here. I want you to meet this guy. Did you know he's in charge of this many people and (laughs) oversees this many people? And and I always think like at that, the angels, you know, on God, they might be like, hey, that's really good. You know, that is really impressive. (laughs) <laughs> but I gotta, sh- but I gotta show you somebody else. You know that this lady here, she actually intercedes for thousands of people every week. And to that, all the angels go, "What? That's amazing!" Yeah. Yeah. Because it's because in our culture, that's who the stars are. That's who the real. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. And yes. so, imagine a culture like back to the UK or whatever. Uh, you know, I mean, some other culture and their way of doing it. Imagine a culture where. When you're humble and you don't brag about yourself, you don't lift yourself up, where you submit and, and the meek inherit the earth. And actually, and we don't make excuses about what the Greek actually defines the meek as. It actually is what we think it is. Because <laughs> we've all heard those sermons that the meek actually means a, you know, a, a violent, blood-shedding warrior or something like that. that yes, we, yes. we like, we found a way. To, I, to, I've never to heard that sermon. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who you've been listening to, Ted, but as a globalist, you've been listening to some weird sermons. You guys, oh, you guys get funny. it though. We've like found totally. some way around oh, trying to funny. make it manly. Um, yes. 
but I'm just saying that in, in God's kingdom, that, that loving one another and that forgiving people and that, that, that laying your life down for others, that that is, that is the high culture value, that that is what makes you quote unquote great in this realm. And that we still struggle with this in our today's church, church world, church culture. And so I think that's part of it. And I also, though, wonder, because we don't have as much problem being humble in our own family or in our own close relationship around my own kids. I don't struggle with this as much. And that's where I wonder, and it brings us back to really trying to maybe strip away independence and lean back to interdependence and really bring it back to relationship that if we really had, if we really had more coffee and tea, if we really had more meals together, we embrace first Corinthians 12, you know, 26 about the body where when one member hurts, we really do all hurt. And when one gets the win, we all get the win that there would be something that would humble us because it's like, wait, somebody that I love and care for that I've shared meals with is hurting. How could I not hurt? Because I love them. And so relationships make us vulnerable, if I could say it that way, as opposed to, come on, you should just be more humble. That's the way Jesus is. That's a hard, that's a hard one. But when we're in relationship, it just makes us more vulnerable because love makes us vulnerable. Hey, I would Ted, I want to end with this question right here. We are a hundred years old. And part of the hope of this podcast is that it's reaching the ears of the next generation. So as you think about the next 10, 50, 100 years, and specifically around us embodying our commitment to being a kingdom people, a kingdom people, is there a pastor or a church that you've interacted with that you think, man, if we were just a movement full churches like this? or pastors like this, that is a four square movement I want to be a part of. I can never nail that down to one, of course. Sure, there are course. so, so many. But, but I would highlight somebody that I consider a foremost mentor, and that's Pastor Ken Pretty on top, senior, that's on the Crow Res in, in Montana. Uh, Pastor Ken is, he's well into his 70s, but you know, Ken actually thinks in Crow and then translates to English still. He's, but you know, when I was doing a lot of my studies and really finding out some of the things that have happened on the Native American journey and everything, and sometimes I'd get pretty worked up or angry or something, and I'd call him on the phone. We're talking, I'm like, did you know this? <laughs> and, and it was interesting because, of course, he'd go, yes, I know that. <laughs> and then he'd go, he'd say, you know, sometimes... Some of this is just too hot to handle. It's just too toxic. I just turn that over to Jesus. Sometimes he just put his arm around me and he just go, you know, these are the things that we just got to be, we just got to stick together on and we just got to go to Jesus with. I, I've never had a conversation where he didn't just point me to Jesus, where he didn't just say, you know what, this is where we got to pray together. Somebody that I feel like has gone through as much pain as anybody that I've ever met in my life. and yet. He loves Jesus more than just about anybody that I've ever met. He's seen more miracles happen. He, he, so the way that he has kind of pastored and led a church that experienced a lot of death during the COVID season, he, their church is continually hosting funerals. And, and yet I see somebody that, how, how come he's happier than the rest of us? And so to answer your question, uh, I know there are pastors all over the place that really exemplify this. So maybe we can keep finding our way through this, I guess I would call it this culture, and look at kingdom like a culture that is so counter to our culture that we live in, and that we can look at the New Testament like a travel guide of this culture and just keep finding and pointing out, wow, that's so different than the culture I live in. And Unfortunately, it's even different than the church culture that I'm in sometimes. And we should point it out and then we should just keep encouraging each other 
just to go, how can we embody this kingdom that Jesus calls us to live in? And yes, we have our distinct movement that we're a part of. But the thing I love about the movement that we're called to be a part of is right on the cornerstone, it says our identity as a movement is found as we reach out to other movements. So so if you don't reach out to other movements in Foursquare, then you're probably not Foursquare. Um, If you don't work with others, then it's probably not going to work. And because we are people of God's kingdom, And so that's how we kind of find ourselves. So I just trust that future leaders and generations are going to find new expressions of what that means to go the extra mile, to love our enemies, to to serve in new ways, to be find humility in new ways, and and to find new kingdom partnerships in fresh ways that are going to outpace all of the older globalists (laughs) or whatever we call ourselves. (laughs) Um, Never. We we can never outpace. Ted Vale, the globalist. The globalist. The globalist. Oh. Yes. Ted, thank you for your time. Yeah, the gift thank of time you so much. And for serving this this movement and the gift, the gifts that you've given. And mm-hmm. may, may the kingdom keep coming in the work that you're doing. Thanks yeah. for thanks for everything. Thank you, guys. You know, as we were having this conversation about the kingdom, and we drew the contrast earlier on that we're not talking about empire. Mm-hmm. There was something in what Ted kept saying. And even I would say in the heart of Amy, that it's important for us to draw out. The path of the kingdom and a real kingdom theology is the path of the cross. Mm -hmm. It's the path of brokenness. Mm. It's what allows humility. It's what allows that that ability to find commonality with others Mm. and to reach out. I would even say that perhaps one of the reasons why Amy put interdenominationalism as in the cornerstone that we are going to reach out to the marginalized and the broken is because she understood what it was to be marginalized and broken. Yeah. I think it's so important. And I, I feel like I want to close our, our episode on kingdom. This is a path, as Stanley Hauerwas says, to follow Jesus is extended training and learning to be dispossessed, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. learning to lay it down. The only way that we get to the broadest possible reaches is by the narrow door of laying down all sense of power, even any sense of power over our own lives. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a, what a, I think a a profound closing. One of the, one of the things about Foursquare that's really beautiful is that we are an intergenerational church. That is that you have the young and the old working together in the work of the kingdom. And I, I'm struck that nowhere in the New Testament are we told to build the kingdom. Mm-hmm. All the language is that our task is to enter the yeah. kingdom, but we never build it. Right. Only God can build the kingdom. Right. Our task is to enter the kingdom together. So, you know, Scott McKnight's whole thing about is a New Testament theologian talks about how there's young people and old people often have different visions of the kingdom. Young people have what he calls a skinny jeans kingdom and old people have pleated pants kingdom. Mm. And one is generally more about the church work and one is about work in the world. Mm. But one of the benefits of working in a, in a denomination like this is we get to do it together yeah. and we don't have to separate all these out. We get to do this as a team yeah. and the work of entering into the kingdom requires all of us to enter into those places that God is asking us to go. Yeah. That's a fitting closing word right there. Yeah. May we develop more kingdom partnerships with everyone. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've looked at the kingdom. What do we have next? We're going to talk about, this is a really core Foursquare thing, Bible thing, but Foursquare thing, and that is we're going to talk about healing. Kingdom thing. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, kingdom thing. And, and, and we're going to actually look at healing. I'm, I think in our next episode, I'm going to try to uh, unpack one of the stickiest Paul verses about yeah. how about salvation and, yeah. and it was, we're going to have a conversation yeah. about, yeah. about healing. It's going to be amazing. Be I'm looking forward to it. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Thank you for listening to the Saying Jesus podcast. On our next episode, Russell and AJ will dive into the topic of healing. Join the conversation and follow along on YouTube, Apple Podcast, or Spotify today. Make sure to subscribe to our channels to stay up to date on new episode releases and resources. And we'd love for you to share this conversation with all your friends and family. Thanks. 
Until next time, we will continue to rest in the fact that Jesus really is the same yesterday, today, and forever.